beginning the session, so we will start in a few seconds. Um, people from any kind of name, so I think they are coming from everywhere. Hi everyone, I think we, we can start right now. So tonight we will have uh, an alumni coming from, she's working in Dubai actually, and I will let Annalisa, program director, introduce uh, everyone. Just mm -hmm. to let you know, you can use the Q&A and the chat anytime to uh, just say hi, or if you have question, don't mm -hmm. hesitate, okay? Yeah. Will you manage the, the, the questions, uh, uh, Najes, or will I do it? You can do it, I will let okay. you. Okay, so uh, welcome to everybody to this uh, career, career talk format. Actually, this is a way to, um, to show how, we, how, how good we are, actually. <laughs> and then thanks to, thanks to the participation of a current student, uh, Nadia Banjic, who is um, uh, currently enrolled in the Master, Master of Science in Luxury Management uh, specialization in brand management. And I have uh, the pleasure to welcome back, even if just virtually, Anne-Marie Buber, um, former student and alumna from uh, oof, five years ago, so uh, real, uh, okay. And then uh, she was a master of science in luxury manager, but in fashion, specialized in fashion. Nowadays, I'm uh, Anne-Marie and then Nadia will, will have a conversation, actually, this is the format, about uh, careers uh, after, uh, after luxury studies, and especially related to the, the, the magic world of Dubai. That is always very interesting. Uh, Nadia, Anne-Marie, stage is yours. Uh, so hello, good afternoon to everyone. I'm extremely grateful to have this opportunity to interview Ms. Babir. So first of all, I'd like to start with a question about, uh, so, so what are some of the main challenges for luxury brand distribution in the Middle East as you come from that part? So that's something we can uh, start with a conversation with. Okay. So for me, I would say that the main challenges is in the distribution that the environment is quite changing. So before um, all the brands, all the companies, they had to go through a local distributor ship. Um, now the law is a bit giving a bit more flexibility that the companies can actually operate directly in Dubai. So for example, I used to work in Richemont before and we're adapting in the process that before our um, big part of sales was mainly wholesale. So we were working with big distributors um, specialized in luxury and jewelry. And today the whole um, environment is changing. So we're trying to implement, uh, it's called ritualization and um, quit our partnerships with the distributors and go more and more directly into um, direct operated boutiques. Just because in luxury for us, it's the advantage that we have more control over our brand, brand strategy. So it's changing a lot in this direction. Okay, but uh, are these strategies also applied for online distribution and are, and are there any challenges for online distribution or no? It goes in line. So if you wanna take the example of Richemont, we have net -a -porter, So it's basically direct operated online and it's going very well. Instead of where we have Sephora, the distributor, not under Richemont, but for example, in um, cosmetics, you have Sephora as um, Sephora has online sales and for example, Namshi or Aunas, and they are operated under um, Shalhoub, for example. So it's under a distributor and we're totally losing visibility and a little bit of um, control. So they do, for example, um, very strong um, discounts, which is not in line with our strategy. Okay, but what do you think is the main influence from going through a distributor or going directly to, to the uh, sales? So say again? What do you think is the main influence for the brands uh, from mm -hmm. like going through a distributor or, or distributing directly by yourself as a brand? It depends always on the company, how they do, but the goal is to operate directly, especially in luxury. So if, for example, 
um, we dedicate a budget and we want to implement retailization, we totally push for it because in the end, also we have a higher, like we have a hundred percent margin if we sell directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even in the cosmetics, we are opening more and more um, um, direct operated stores. Like you see, for example, on La, um, we had the example on Estee Lauda and also in L'Oreal. We are going more and more directly. Whereas before, you would see cosmetics mainly in um, wholesale or yeah, department stores. Because they said it's not profitable to pay the rent to be directly operating a store just for cosmetics. But the higher you go in luxury, the more we see now, especially in the Middle East, it's working well. Okay, and can you tell me a little bit more about who are your clients in the Middle East and which option uh, do they uh, like more? Like, do they like to go to a department stores more or directly to your brand stores? It's a big mix. So for us, actually, um, all channels are doing well. Um, and you have a mix that some people are going mainly to department stores and others to uh, direct operated. But if you look, we have, for example, our malls, Dubai Mall and Mall of Emirates. We have so many direct operated stores. So if you go in, it's basically you feel like you're in a department, you feel like you're in a department shop, even on, let's say, luxurious level. Okay. And are there any particular stra uh, strategies for pricing between these two options or the price stays the same? And what is the difference? Uh, because what I noticed when I went to Dubai, what's the difference in the price between the Middle East and in contrast to Europe? So uh, first question, the price should usually stay the same okay. the, uh, in wholesale and in retail. Um, but then in reality, it's not this case because that's what we are fighting always with our distributors because in Dubai, if, if you see probably you have a lot of discounts level, you have a lot of promotions. So basically, um, in our direct operated stores, we're trying to avoid any discounts. Um, while our distributors, they don't really care about the, the brand image to destroy it. And especially when we were working in Richemont on high-end watches, they were just completely giving discounts nonstop. And we would lose our clients because they would always go directly to the distributor asking for discounts. And, um, and here, discount is very attractive because it works very well with um, our Arabic uh, consumer group and also the Indians. So whenever they know, they get discounts at the distributor. And it was a common case. Any what you want, it would be on discount. So we try to fight it. And um, to your second question about the pricing Middle East versus Europe. Yeah. So the goal is to align all the prices worldwide, right? Um, currently, it's not aligned at all. So, for example, usually, if you look at fashion, or if you look in general, the prices in the Middle East, um, let's say, 10% um, higher, if you go, for example, to LVMH, 10, uh, the same product is 10% higher here versus the European market, okay? Do you know the reason for it? Um, I would say it was in the beginning the price strategy and it was it's difficult to adapt it so it takes time um, and I think because they know also the the consumer um, they have more power to buy the products so that's why they keep the price high but then for example when it comes to um, jewelry okay uh -huh. jewelry and watches we're actually eight to 10% lower. So if you go to Cartier today, the same clue bracelet will cost you 10% less in Dubai than in Europe. So a lot of people buy here. And this is, um, let's say we're trying to adapt it. So I was working before in um, pricing in Richemont and every time we had a price increase, this question came up. We said, no, we have to, uh, we have to align with the, um, the European market. So they try to do it, but the price increase is going so fast from both sides that it's um, it's still difficult to adapt. Okay, but taking into account the whole supply chain and this, all the distribution strategies that you have mentioned earlier, uh, you personally, what do you think, to what extent is the relationship with both the employees within the stores and the customer is important for the final sales? 
So in lecture, it's very important because um, I would, I don't know how it's in other markets, but for example, here in the Middle East, you always have a um, client advice and you WhatsApp them. So whatever I need from the shop, I, in, to every boutique, to every brand, I have a WhatsApp number. So basically my um, relationship is very good. And a lot of people from this market, especially like high-end consumers, um, they have their contact person and they are, they are more willing to message this one and the person will arrange already everything uh, rather than they go and do their research and do shopping and check if the piece is in stock. So the relationship is very important. Yeah, it's, it's crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. The next question would be like, uh, what did you notice uh, the difference between uh, the sales and the whole, the whole supply chain distribution before the COVID and after the pandemic? Is there like a big change in strategy and in, in sales and the overall impact? Yes, I think so. Corona caused a lot of um, panic, I would say. And now everyone wants to change. Everyone wants to focus on the right things. So that's why, for example, in Dubai, we are not in a lockdown now. And when I go to the office, it's the whole time like putting pressure, a lot of new strategies, a lot of challenges, because we try basically to adapt to the new market. And the, when before Corona, we were just, I would say in luxury, we were slow. We were slow in everything. When it came to supply chain, especially, we didn't invest in um, technology. Technologically, um, we were just counting on long lead times. So everything was very slow and very traditional. And I think now after Corona, they woke up and they said, okay, we need to adapt faster to the market to respond. And this way they tried to adapt. And also I think a big role it's not only that they switched, for example, from keeping the focus on retail and marketing, which they thought, okay, this is where our budget goes in luxury because this is, um, um, let's say, this improves our brand strategy, our dream. So now they're actually putting the focus on supply chain. And also, I would say, uh, in terms of distribution, I would say a big part of Corona is now that the focus is on e-commerce. So all the luxurious brands, they are suddenly trying to push on e-commerce. Before it was like a plan. Okay, this is the plan. We go step by step into e-commerce very slow. Even if you look at net -Porter, they had their apparel and everything. But now after Corona, they said, okay, now we are pushing quickly. High-end watches, high-end jewelry. So you find pieces that are super expensive on an e-commerce platform that you didn't see before. Or let's say they push everything from cosmetic on e-commerce. So we are really putting the um, attention on it. Okay. So with it being said, do you have do you see any new trends emerging for the future? You personally, do you have a feeling something that some new trends will occur? Um, the trend I'm seeing now, because basically now we are all sh like trying to involve e-commerce and um, when we involve e-commerce we always forget that um, e-commerce is let's say for us in luxury just a comp complementary uh -huh. step in the customer's journey so i feel like the trend is now that we did the step we know that we need to be in e-commerce and the next step is that we are trying to connect all channels so you see for example that um the like last month, Montblanc, they implemented, they followed basically Louis Vuitton and they said, okay, you can do your research, you can go on online mm -hmm. and you can reserve the product in any boutique you want to go tomorrow. So they are linking both channels. And I, I think this is going to be the, the trend in the future that we will have or what's missing basically now that all the channels will be much more connected. So basically you as a consumer, you have one, let's say, customer journey and wherever you want to be now, you will find your product. You can look online, you find your product, you WhatsApp on um, your client advisor in Dubai Mall, you pick the piece up in, um, I don't know, Mall of Emirates or in the future, maybe even in another country. I think this is the going in the strand. Sorry, okay. Nadia, there is a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who is asking, is the purchasing power and the desire to spend on brands is the same post-pandemic in the Middle East? Post-pandemic? Yeah, if the purchasing power and the desire to spend 
is the same um, as a, in the post pandemic in, in, in your country? Currently, the same as before? Yes, currently it is. Why? It's because the spending power is basically on our local group and they are not allowed or they cannot really travel now. Before they used to spend the summer, for example, in Europe. So you would see they would spend everything in London, Paris, south of France, and now they are not allowed to travel. So they stay in the Middle East. And we see, for example, um, Abu Dhabi is closed. So suddenly our boutique in Abu Dhabi is performing super well. Our boutiques in Qatar are performing. So currently it is. I think when it starts to calm down, maybe a little bit longer term, you will see the um, um, impact. Okay. And um, so it means that the pandemic is really relaunching the local consumption. Yes. No. No. Okay. Yes. So it's a, it's, a new, it's, a, it's a new vision for luxury brands. Um, sorry, Nadia, I have a question for, uh, for uh, Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, when, when actually, when uh, students are, uh, start uh, their, uh, their, their, uh, their studies with me, then in most of the cases, they're interested in marketing, as you were, okay? So now okay. you're working in, uh, in the supply chain that is uh, sometimes is considered less fancy, less uh, interesting. What is your perception now that actually now that you have worked in marketing and now you're working in supply chain, actually? Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Um, okay, the difference is that, for example, when I started working in, when, in supply chain, I still find it very boring. Huh? Um, but now I see the positive part that it's actually interesting when I come to forecasting. And when I see, for example, that especially with this pandemic, my job was secured while well, they started to cut first on marketing. Um, mm. So in this way, it's changing. Could you and ever I think imagine? Also, I think also that because supply chain is something I never imagined to, to know or to learn or never imagined I would go into this direction. And now, mm -hmm. for example, if one day I want to open my own business, I wouldn't be scared anymore of this part because marketing basically you do it with a little bit more intuition, whereas supply chain, now I learned what I was forced to learn, what I would never look into it, what I always found too boring. Mm -hmm. Did you like numbers when you did accounting at IUM? I hated it, and now I'm good <laughs> in it. <laughs> the yes. master. Accounting. And now everything is just numbers for me. Okay, sorry, Nadia. Do you want to go ahead with your uh, with your uh, interesting questions? Are there any more questions related to this topic, or we can move on to the career questions? Uh, it, uh, no, actually, it's a conversation. So you okay? Uh, okay. So what I would like to ask you, as a current student, is from your your point of view, uh, what are the career aspects and opportunities in the Middle East and Dubai, especially? Okay, so. Like I came to Dubai, I only knew I want to work in luxury. So basically I targeted all the brands and I would give you as a current student, the same advice to just go on LinkedIn, apply directly to all the brands. And for example, me, I stepped short because I took the job and it was in supply chain, for example. So um, I would still go for it because it's the, the whole experience that counts. And if you want to go to Dubai, especially it doesn't matter in which department you are, it counts more the experience that Dubai is a really fast paced market. Mm -hmm. market. So it goes very fast, you will be challenged, you're not treated like, um, like uh, let's say when you start on a junior level or internship level, you're not treated like this, you always have to give full speed. So you learn a lot on this level. Do you feel there is an opportunity for growth after like uh, an internship to start a career there and to, to find a concrete job? Yes, so I would say that in Dubai, it goes much faster than in Europe because um, here, even young talents, like if you're performing, you can grow very fast. So basically here, they say that you stay in every position two years. But then for example, if you apply, it's always easier because the market is small here. If you apply to the competition, you can even grow to another level after one year. But it's always you're going on full speed and basically, the companies here, um, the work environment is very young. 
So everyone is uh, in their late 20s, uh, 30s, not like in Europe, for example, that you have someone experienced in a position, but this person will be already in their 50s. Here you see really young people. Yeah, so there are definitely opportunities for growth. And uh, is there uh, like, are there any languages required? Is it mandatory to know Arabic or? Hmm. I mean, I'm questions. here without Arabic. And <laughs> usually all the companies, they are really international. So the language spoken is um, English. And I would say when you're in luxury, unofficially also French, <laughs> French or Italian. Um, so these are the languages spoken around me way more than Arabic. Mm -hmm. Now there's, for example, they require sometimes um, Arabic speakers in internships because they are pushing for the locals to, to get internships and get into the working environment. But otherwise I would say, don't worry, there's no Arabic required. Okay, and as a student coming from a non-EU country, I'm from Serbia, uh, what is the process of getting a visa? Is it easy or complicated? How does it function? So everyone needs a visa coming to Dubai, even me and I have a German passport. So basically you, you, can, come, you can come to Dubai and stay three months on a tourist visa. Okay. And um, if you want to stay longer, you need a work visa. So everyone, the moment you apply, to, you get a job in a company, you automatically have a working visa. So they're helping with the whole process. Yeah, they do everything for you. Okay, that, that's amazing. Because your visa is basically uh, your employee is always responsible for your stay in Dubai. Okay. I'm Actually, so, sorry, Nadia, this is, this is why to international students, Dubai is, um, is, very, is very interesting because it's super easy. You don't need any, uh, you, there, there are no barriers, there are no passport barriers. Uh, and then this is a, a good starting point because it's an international environment where um, it's a luxury destination because actually luxury clients are going there. So there is a, it, it's a vibrant, I would say, environment uh, for young people, young professionals willing to learn uh, how to work in, 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 in the luxury business. And then from there, you can move to other, other regions because you're already working for a company and they can even help you to move to another country, even a European one, for example. So once you're in, the, the, your, your passport is, uh, the, your visa is sponsored. Uh, sorry, there, there are two questions for, for uh, Anne-Marie. What does a typical day look like? And what are the minimum salaries in, uh, in luxury in Dubai? What does a typical day look like? I mean, typical day looks like that I'm going at nine o'clock to work, <laughs> finishing everything. And then usually working hours are quite long. So you can stay in the office up to 10 p.m. because it's really a working mentality. But then every single weekend feels like you're on vacation because you have the beach, you have the sunshine, you have everything you want here. So... That's how it looks like. You really focus a lot on work. You work on fast pace, but you also enjoy a lot. And Dubai is always, that's why it's a con consumption city. So you have, let's say, good salaries, but you also spend because you enjoy. And um, <laughs> in terms of salaries, so basically when it comes to, um, when it comes to the salaries for internships in luxury, luxury is always much lower paid in Dubai than any other um, industry. So you start basically, let's say on 2000 euro, or if you negotiate well, it can go, let's say entry level 3000 euro. But always keep in mind that for example, your rent will be, um, let's say minimum 800,000 uh, euro minimum. So um, that's how it starts. And then later when you get a permanent job, um, I would say you can get anything between 3,500 euro and uh, 6,000 euro. It always depends how you negotiate. But the first step is always the most difficult. And I would say to everyone, don't care about the first salary. The moment you put your step into a company, because the first one is always the most difficult. And the moment you're in the Middle East market, after this, you can move after half year, after one year. And with every move you're doing, you always have the salary jump of um, 1,000 or 2,000 euro. Okay, thank you. Nadia. Are there any more questions from the students? Oh, I wanted to, okay, I said, yes, there is, a, there is another one. Thank you. 
how do you perceive priority now and in the future connected to the entire health components, product and services, prevention, and high level of priority in this pandemic time? So if you have um, any, any, any view on this, Anne-Marie? Can you repeat the question? Right. Because, uh, how can I? Oh, sorry, I was trying to do it to make it bigger. How do you perceive priority now and in the future connected to the entire health components? So product and services, the prevention and high level of priority in, the, in this pandemic time. I think, um, so luxury and health, and then uh, if there are some, uh, what are the priorities between luxury and health? This is what I, I was asking for, Doran. And how do you predict to be developed in the future? Is the... So basically that all the companies are going environmental friend, uh, friendly. Is this the question? And I asked, I read it in this way, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the whole marketing for companies. So they really try to follow, follow this trend. Um, but I don't, I honestly don't know how it's going to develop. <laughs> Difficult, but actually, let's say that in Dubai the situation is pretty cool. So, is uh, the situation is uh, is not that bad as in as in other part of the world, uh, because of the you got the vaccine much before many other countries, and then uh, everything is open. So museums, uh, everything. So people are uh, really having a real life, except for the mask. This is the question. Yes. Because we all get vaccinated here. We are pushed to get vaccinated. They want to, even yesterday, they announced that whoever, for those people who don't get vaccinated, there will be restrictions um, mm -hmm. in their lifestyle. So basically, they push everyone for it. And yeah. yeah, everything is open. So we don't really have those issues. No. It's a, it's a very good place to go now that uh, everything is closed in other, in other, in other parts of the world. Yeah, but also on the contrary, when, when we actually had lockdown in Dubai, I wasn't here, but it lasted, I don't know, maybe two, three months. Uh, all companies were drastically firing, not like in Europe where you were a bit more protected. He immediately, they were firing, they were giving uh, salary cuts, I think even up to 35%, bonus cuts, so very drastic. Now we are doing well because it's all open, so I don't feel it, but. It was not easy. Exactly. Hmm. And then an, a, a nice question from, uh, uh, looking for the name, from uh, Johanna. How close is what you do now to what you learned at IUM? Is the program reflecting the actual day-to-day -day tasks of the industry? How many group projects do you do in your daily way? your daily job <laughs> <laughs> i would say um it's like in school so for me the um, the project we had analisa that reflects the most what i'm doing today is we had a seminar in with burberry on buying and um, merchandising and buying mm -hmm. this was for me the closest and for example when i do forecasting now it's uh, it's very similar so it helped me a lot but i would say the task honestly doesn't matter because if I do today supply chain or tomorrow marketing, basically I have my experience. I can do anything somehow today. So I would say what the master really reflects is that you need to focus on your connections. And um, also it taught me a lot about luxury, uh, the luxury industry. So for example, what I'm seeing now I have the advantage that I actually studied luxury compared to my colleagues. So I can exactly see, aha, this is the, it, it goes automatically for me that I'm thinking already in this way of luxury, that this is the experience, hmm. this is the strategy, this is where we have to stand. Whereas sometimes my colleagues who didn't study it are a little bit like, um, you know, tunnel focus. Hmm. Interesting so, point. So for me, the master, it helped me a lot. And I would never like, uh, regretted my decision in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Nadia, do you want to go ahead and then I uh, will do a ping pong? Yes, I have one more question. Uh, as a current student, would you recommend me and the, the fellow students to start our career in the Middle East? And what is your overall level of satisfaction? So, especially now, I would say go for it. 
um, it has a lot of advantages. We already brought them up. First of all, you can easily get here. Um, Dubai is in a very attractive city. You have all the every single company or brand that you imagine in luxury is going to be here. Um, the, the offices, are, the headquarters are huge here. So you have really good possibilities. Your lifestyle is going to be amazing. Your network is going to be amazing. Um, and plus, obviously, now with the pandemic, it's very easy because we are not, um, we are not, let's say, sacrificing from it. Everything is open. So we're still, let's say, having job opportunities here. So I would recommend it definitely. And on top, you will grow very fast. So you can establish easier a life and a high experience, and then you always can go to back to Europe. Like, for example, I know I will not stay forever here. I want to go at some point back to Europe, but I already have my base of experience, um, knowledge, and um, let's say you get resistant in Dubai. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions from students? Because from Yes, actually. Uh, how is Made in Italy, of course, is a, a Valentina, as an Italian student. Uh, how is Made in Italy luxury brands perceived in Middle East market, in the Middle East market? Um, there is a, a different perception in the country of origin. Honestly, I would say people here care less about it. It's more the European consumers who are more specific. Uh, if it's, let's say, LVMH or caring brands, they are very specific about it. Here, they go across all brands. And sometimes even you see the consumers are spending on something that doesn't really show quality just because um, the brand stabilized uh, the brand perception well in the market. Because it's branded, yes. Exactly, because it's branded. And they are not like very sensitive when it comes to pricing, quality, or made in. They will tell you, okay, they are proud because the shoes are made in Italy, but no one really knows what's behind it. So in this case, it's more for status than, uh, so the, 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 the conspicuous, uh, the conspicuous uh, uh, consumption uh, that is really connected to this, yes. And then uh, can, um, can I ask you just to recap uh, your, your career path? Since you move out of, the, uh, of Monaco, what happened? So you went there and then what happened? Yes, so I went to Dubai directly because I got accepted for an internship with Mercedes. Mm -hmm. I did the inter um, um, internship for six months and then I got accepted in the, um, uh, what was it? Um, career development plan from uh, L'Oreal. So I switched to L'Oreal. I was there in sales and business development, also in the luxury division. Um, and from there, I got a permanent job offer from Richemont. So I changed to Richemont. So basically every in Richemont, I stayed uh, almost three years. And uh, that's why I went into supply chain. And from Richemont now, because it was time for me to grow and I was pushing for a promotion and um, it, it couldn't, I couldn't get it in Richemont. And that's why I went to Estee Lauder. And in Estee Lauder, I'm working on my brands, uh, La Mer, Bobby Brown and Clinique. And I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm the demand planner. So I'm doing forecasting there. So, and what is your next plan? Next plan is, um, so basically my plan was to go to Estee Lauder to get another push in my career. And any next step I'm gonna do is gonna be a move to Europe. Hmm. So you want to go back? Yes. Because usually how many, on average, how many years people are staying in Dubai as expats? But stay short term usually. So I'm already here almost uh, yeah five years, I think five and a half maybe. So this is considered as long. Yeah, actually people are, are just coming yes. and growing and then they, they are go back. Um, and uh, um, actually, you you already replied to uh, Tara Tara's question. Why did you why did you decide to work in the Middle East more or less? Actually, why you applied to uh, to positions in uh, in Dubai? Why? I mean, I wanted to stay in Monaco, but uh, I also wanted to work for a big luxurious brand or company. 
And um, that's why I needed to find um, a country, let's say, or a metropole that offers me um, big headquarters. Mm -hmm. And also like personally, I always need my sunshine. So basically my option was to move to Milano or to Dubai. And I got accepted right away to Dubai. And that's why I never um, expected I would stay so long, but I'm still here. Still, here, still there, yes. Yeah. Um, did your master help you to get a job in luxury? Or are there people who can get a luxury job without a luxury master? There are definitely a lot of people who get a job in luxury without the master. And this makes me, let's say, one of the rare candidates. And I would say it pushes my CV a lot because no matter, I noticed this myself, wherever I apply in the luxury industry, they directly point out, aha, she studied luxury management and uh -huh. already um, it's, a, it's a big push for the CV. And whenever I speak also to HR, like outside of my company, they always point this out that I, I'm a strong candidate because I already studied luxury management and the fact that I worked for so many um, different luxury multinational companies. Mm -hmm. So I would and, say definitely. Uh, and um, the fact that you studied in Monaco, Monte Carlo, so putting Monaco on your CV, did intrigue people or, or uh, HR and then S. So can you? Yes, definitely. That's what I'm saying. I studied luxury, luxury management and Monaco is basically the branding here. Because whenever they reach this, they will definitely uh, pick out my CV already because it's opening the eyes. And whenever they recommend me also, it's easier to, to just mention the word. She studied in Monaco, Monaco Luxury Management and people already remember. Because like we have... We had, yes. um, we had uh, uh, a guest speaker the other day, Riccardo Giraudi, the owner of here of many, many restaurants. And then he said at the very beginning of my career, I was uh, actually, he's a past student of IUM. And then he went to ABS and then the first phone call he got after sending 200 CVs was a person then who invited him to, to, to the meeting. And then we, um, when he knocked at the door, and then, uh, buongiorno, I'm, uh, I'm Riccardo Girardi. Ah, you are the Monaco guy. Actually, uh, because people remember the fact that you are studying luxury in Monaco, that is the one of the main source of, of luxury, one of the main environment for luxury. So you're confirming that as well. Confirming, totally. And no one pays attention to which task, which task I did, what I studied in which program. No one pays attention to my bachelor, uh, to my grades, no one. It's just the fact, okay, luxury management in Monaco. They don't even care if I studied under luxury management, fashion, retail, or what, what else, hospitality. No one cares about it. Yes, so I, I know, but students have to be convinced about it. So yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that. Um, another an, uh, anonymous attendee is asking, did you, ever, did you know everything to perform your job? or did you get training for the, from the company? So basically, I think especially in Dubai, you don't get any trainings or handovers. You just get thrown into the cold water and it's expected and you have to deliver. So you learn it with time, with, with the experience, but you're really um, under pressure and you really have to be proactive and curious to learn it by yourself. No one will take you in the company by the hand and uh, explain things to you. Yeah. No. Always be proactive, this is in general. So be angry, so be willing to learn. Okay, um, did you first, up, Anna, there is another question that is related to your move to Dubai. Did you first apply for a job, then move, or did you go to Dubai and get the, and then you got the job there? I think it was the first one, as yes, you said. I applied, but I know many people who come first and I would say um, it's helpful because when you're here already and know the market, you get connected to a lot of recruiters and you mm -hmm. can go. It's, it's even very popular and common to go for coffee here with, with, um, uh, with a recruiter or, or see a recruiter for a drink. I, I got my Richemont interview because I had a coffee with the recruiter in Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's it's how very she was, informal. Exactly. Informal. No. Uh, do you think, Emma is asking, uh, do you think Dubai is the same as it was when you moved there? 
for, for, uh, for uh, when you started your career? Or is there any other country area that is taking that place? I would say that Dubai is taking the place, mm. especially still, it's still very, a vibrant place to go. Yes. What Can about you? Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi, I mean, it's connected to Dubai, but it's very calm and there's no headquarters, not in luxury. Mm. Yeah. It's more and, government uh, and uh, gas and finance a bit, but the rest is all in Dubai. In Dubai happen, the expert business happen. Yeah especially in luxury, I would say. And then uh, how, so actually soon uh, the Expo 2020, the postponed ex Expo 2020 will start. Uh, is Dubai hiring many people or uh, is, do, do you perceive there is a, uh, a need for, for a new, uh, new people coming to support this huge event? There is definitely. So there's a lot of people coming here. Now it slowed down a little bit because of Corona, but it's picking up again. Um, and in luxury itself, Maybe it's hotels. okay. In hot it's more in hospitality, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe it's, it's the moment to, to go there for yeah. the ones, uh, maybe for Nadia and, and your cohort. It's, it can be really a good, uh, an interesting move. Yesterday, I got the confirmation. Maybe next year, I have to bring my hospitality students to Dubai. Yes. <laughs> I'm in jealous of yes. huh? I'm jealous I'm not a next year student. <laughs> Go to Dubai. We will meet there. We will meet there, Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay. Are the expenses for housing, food, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, much higher compared to European countries? For example, compared to Monaco. Uh, sorry, who is asking the for this question, uh, Estefania, actually Monaco, so, sorry, then I let you reply, uh, uh, Marie. Actually, Monaco is not that expensive, if, but if you go out every night, uh, not this year, so this year is, is um, students are not spending one euro outside, but uh, usually uh, Monaco is not that expensive, except if you go out every night and then if you drink Dom Perignon and then you go to Cipriani. But if not, is not, because real estate is, a, is, a, is, high, is higher than in other locations, no more than London, no more than um, center of London, center of Milan. So more or less is the same. But for the cost of living, it depends on how you set your, uh, your, uh, your lifestyle. Honestly, there are people uh, having a normal life here. Of course, uh, people are going out every single night, uh, doing spending whatever. Uh, so back to the question: Do you think, uh, uh, Anne Marie, Dubai is um, an aspetta? Are the expenses for housing, food, and uh, in Dubai much higher than the other places? I would say it's just what you said about Monaco. It's exactly the same. I would compare to Monaco. Um, and obviously your expenses go out if you go for crazy dinners uh, in fine dining, um, your expenses go up. But the housing I would compare to Monaco, um, food as well. Before real estate used to be much more higher, before it was comparable to London. But obviously you were paying the prices of London, but you always had your concierge, you had your gym, you had your pool in the house. Now the prices went much lower, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. compared with Monaco. Okay, okay. Um, there, is, there is another... Is Monaco, uh, is Monaco or Dubai better for work-life balance? Hmm. Um, I think Maybe. in Dubai we work longer hours. Yeah, I think it's Monaco, honestly. Uh, but then, but then it, it, it depends on uh, it depends on what you want to do. In Monaco, you, in Dubai, you are going out uh, much more than in Monaco uh, because, of course, there are even many more uh, many more opportunities. But it's really is a very um, uh, running uh, running city, much more than Monaco, I would say. It depends what what a person needs. In Monaco, yeah. I would say I have more free time. In Dubai, I have less free time, but a higher salary. 
And no. if I have the weekend, if I have free time, I can enjoy myself in the same way in Monaco as in Dubai, because in both places you have restaurants and the beach. Many more in Dubai than Monaco, but yes, of course. Uh, they're asking if they can connect with you on LinkedIn. I deleted my LinkedIn, but by email anytime. Why you deleted your LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> I just deleted it a few months ago. <laughs> so the anti-law of networking. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> but um, everyone can connect with me by email. Anytime welcome. Okay, so maybe... Or by we'll... social media, I don't mind. Ah, you are on Instagram, so that's it. Yes. But you are on Instagram, so you can. Uh... I'm on Instagram, then on my emails and on LinkedIn. That's for sure. <laughs> She's a fashionista, so you will you will have. I, I, I'm dreaming anytime. I'm, I'm looking at your post <laughs> on Instagram, so you can do it. But guys, if you want, you can connect with my LinkedIn page. I'm I'm available if you want. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, um, what did you do when you were an intern in Mercedes? at Mercedes? I did sales, sales and marketing, long time ago. Long time ago, yeah. And then uh, do you have, uh, did, did you meet IOM uh, people living in Dubai? Because actually Dubai it, in the past and now a bit less, it used to be the second biggest luxury community outside, uh, outside Monaco. So I always kept in touch with a lot of people. I'm in touch with uh, Juan, with Melissa. Um, Sarah also lives here. Um, who else? Eva, you met Eva last time. So I would say I'm in touch with a lot of people from IUM. And even if I'm not direct in touch, you always see like, aha, this person through Instagram, he's still in Dubai, you see what's going on. So I would say we, we keep in touch quite well. And then uh, uh, what did you study at university? So I think, I assume before joining IUM. Um, I studied international business and marketing. So not finance, uh, not uh, numbers. Okay. And, uh, but actually guys, the, we are not looking for any specific uh, educational background. Uh, we, we can, uh, so we are, we are really open to uh, a diversified uh, cohort. So this is something that we, we, we really like. Usually we have people from uh, law degrees and then engineering communication uh, business. There is everything. This is not really, really important. There's not a barrier. So the previous bachelor is not a barrier, I would say. Actually, Nadine wants to connect with you on Instagram. So how she can find you? What is your... Um, my name is Anna Bober, A-N-A-B-O-B-E-R. Anna I will, Bober, yes, voila, I'm typing the on chat. the chat. Okay. No, 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 wait. One N. One N, yes. Like uh, Anna, uh, Anna, okay. Today I will voila. accept every follower, tomorrow I'm closing. <laughs> 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 Good. Nadia, so are you now convinced that you are moving to Dubai? No. Well, I'm convinced, convinced, but for the beginning, I found an internship here in Monaco. So I, I will. Okay. <laughs> you have already found it? Yes. Good. In what? Scepter. You know the Scepter in company? A... Scepter company. Sorry, the line is not good. So what? The Scepter company. Ah, Zept, ah but of course. Easy. <laughs> ah. So the cultural, the cultural connection. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so good, good for you. I'm happy for that. So guys, if there are no more questions, I think that it's time to, uh, to close this session. I, I thank you so much, Anne-Marie and then Nadia for playing the, the game tonight. And then, uh, so I hope, um, so you will, I, I hope to see you. Actually, I know I recognize some names in the, in the attendees. And then, uh, uh, Anne Marie, I'm waiting for you uh, soon here in uh, in the in the Côte d'Azur. And Nadia, see you see you in uh, the coming days at school. See you. Thank you very much. Good. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Nadia, there is a message I think for you in the chat. Uh, she left already. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Bye, guys. Bye bye. bye.